Dooby dooby doo. Come on, Rockfin. Come on, Rockfin. You're taking forever. Load. Load. You're always slowing me down, man. You're always slowing me down. Any day now. Oh boy, I really do not have time to wait for Rockfin. Why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? Glitchy. Anyways, let's get started. Hello, guys. Happy, happy Tuesday. Welcome to Sabby Sab's podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. You may have heard me talking to myself in the intro before I went live. Rockfin was being, it was being Rockfin. Let's just put it that way. But I think it is up and going now. So awesome. Awesome. If you are new, I want to let you know that Sabby Sab's podcast is a part of Revolutionary Blackout Network. You can catch me there on Thursdays for the roundtable and Fridays for the Savvy Show. You can catch me here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Want to give quick shout outs to people in the chat and shout out to everyone watching on YouTube, Rockfin, and Twitter. What is going on, everyone? I see a lot of comments. Shout out to CBC Voter giving a lot of emojis there. Says Savvy Sabs Doobie Doo. What's going on? Etome Third says good vibes. I see the little clover there. St. Patrick's Day is this week. Most of you know I do live in the Boston area. It does get pretty lit here that time of year. What's going on? Hannah G says, let's go. Shout out to Anon user says, dooby dooby doo. Greetings, Lawrence Johnson. Always great to see you. You're a savvy member. Says, dooby dooby doo. Greetings, sweary fairy. Says, yay, technology. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> I know, right? Shout out to Derek says, dooby dooby doo. Greetings, Yipper99 says, one more hour, please. I haven't caught up with daylight savings time. Me neither. In fact, about two o'clock today, I thought I was going to crash. Not kidding. I've been up since like six this morning. Yeah, I feel you, man. A-O-H-T-O-6. Greetings, says Kim Iverson. Suspension got lifted. Yep, I'm going to talk about that as well. Shout out to Leroy says, good day, everyone, who's always a savvy member as well. What's going on, Kyle, who's a savvy member, says uh, either the, that's a chicken or a rooster. Greeting Sean M says, yo, what up on Tuesday? Shout out to Pirate Alex says, hey, guys, what's going on to share? Always great to see you, says, is Glenn on the show? We can always hear you, or maybe you're doing that on purpose. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I forget and sometimes I'm just like, screw it. I, I talk to myself. I sometimes answer myself and that is that is questionable. Sorry about that. Uh, but no, Glenn is not on, on my show. I actually should try to get him. Shout out to Eric T. Red for uh, this as well. Happy Tuesday, all lefty friends. Eric is also a savvy member. What's going on? Angela says, hi, everyone. Shout out to KM4OOS says, hi. 
The traveling nomads in the house says greeting from the land of absolute vodka. Oh, buddy. I have some stories about absolute vodka from college. One day I'm going to tell you guys about that. I don't drink absolute vodka anymore. Shout out to Jack says, what happened to Kim? I'm going to get into that, Jack. What's going on? Jay says, what up, Sabs? Watching. Shout out to Pittsburgh dude says, no more young people should die for rich men wars. Rich old men wars. I agree. I agree. Thanks so much for the super chat and shout out to Andrew Matthews. What's your opinion on bat vigilantes in Gotham? Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. I am going to go see the new Batman movie this weekend. I'm going to go in calm because I don't want to have high expectations. I did not like when Ben Affleck played Batman. He's not a good actor for that role. He's just not good with superheroes. I saw him in Daredevil. It wasn't good. I'm just going to be honest. Uh, but I'm going to go in with an open mind, but not high expectations because I really want to see how, uh, Robert is going to play this role. So there's been a lot of Batmans through my life. Been a lot of them. I still think Michael Keaton is probably one of my faves and, um, oh shoot. I forgot his name. Chris Christian, Christian Bale. Those are my two favorites. Shout out, Sherry says, sending peace and love to you and all the viewers today. What's going on, Greg Bruce, who's a savvy member, says, hey, lefty friends. Zach says, hey, Sab, peace. What's going on, Delthea Simmons, who's a savvy member, says, hey, hey, everyone. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get into it. Yes, I am. I am going to go see the new Batman movie. Again, I'm going to try to go in with the open mind because the only thing I've seen Robert Pattinson play is the Twilight movies and he was in Harry Potter. I forget which one, but he was also in Harry Potter. So that's the only things I've seen him in. So I'm going to try to be open. Okay. I'm going to be open. Uh, Lawrence Johnson said, Adam West is the real Batman. That's what my mom says too. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Quick shout out to everyone who is a savvy patron. Thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate that. If you are interested, I have four categories. They're called members, savvy, sabsters, or ultimate. And I want to give a shout out to new patrons, Anthony Alicia. That's a pretty name. Betsy Gardstein and Lariat. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate your support. Their names are also strolling across the bottom of the screen there. So what are we going to talk about tonight? Disagree on Ben Affleck. Really? You think Ben Affleck was a good Batman? Ben Affleck has this monotone voice, and I think it only works for certain movies, like the Boston movies that he usually plays in. And even with that, it's not as, like at his best because he doesn't do a good Boston accent because he is originally from California, spent some time in Cambridge. And if you go to Cambridge, a lot of people from Cambridge don't have that Boston accent. In fact, most people in the city now don't have that accent at all because it's been gentrified. You really have to go to the North Shore, South Shore to really get that accent now. Um, but yeah, I can go on about Ben Affleck all day. That's a whole other conversation. So what are we talking about tonight? Let me go ahead and pull up my thumbnail here. Doobie doobie doo. All right, tonight we're talking about Glenn Greenwald checks Anna Navarro on Tucker. That's an interesting conversation. Uh, you shouldn't be surprised by what you hear from the women on The View anymore, but I thought that she was deeply wrong and just really out of touch and hypocritical. I'm going to get into that story. Also, we're going to discuss Kim Iverson suspended. Yes, I know her suspension, I think, has, has just been lifted. Um, but this is actually in reference to her, her own channel, not the Hill rising. So I'll get into that. And we're going to discuss Sam Cedar versus Bill Maher. What has Bill Maher done this time? So that should be an interesting conversation as well. So I think I'm going to go ahead and get started with Kim Iverson suspended. Uh, so let's go ahead and pull up that video. Eric. And let me give you guys a little bit of background here. It was only just two weeks ago. Kim Iverson was on my show for the women's summit and she was on the healthcare panel. Literally, I think it was like a two or a few days after that. 
she found out that the Hill Rising was suspended on YouTube. So they couldn't, like when you're suspended, you can't uh, live stream for like a week. I'm not sure if you can upload either. I have to double check that, but you can't stream for like a week, which can really hurt you, like in reference to the algorithm. Granted, they're on the corporate algorithm. Then just yesterday, I saw a tweet from Kim saying that her own channel was suspended, her solo channel. So <laughs> remember, remember Lee Camp was on here yesterday. We were talking about this. We were talking about the censorship and it's, it's not going to stop. Um, and people, we really have to be careful what we say, how we say it. Even if we don't really say it, we got to be careful what we play. Even with this video, I have to be careful what I play. So uh, her channel was suspended. It's ridiculous. I'm going to go ahead uh, into the video. So I want you to listen to what Kim has to say here. What's on your radar, Kim? Well, YouTube has struck again. The Kim Iverson Show channel is currently suspended for one week for violating YouTube's medical misinformation policy. Now, some of you may know I have my own YouTube show that I started a little over three years ago. Throughout 2019 and into early 2020, before the pandemic, my channel grew very quickly, averaging 15 to 20,000 subscribers per month. My focus was on the Democratic primary, of course, and foreign policy. I interviewed candidates such as Tulsi Gabbard and Marianne Williamson and attended the Democratic debate in Atlanta. I traveled to the West Bank to witness the Israeli-Palestinian conflict firsthand and did in-depth pieces on the various U.S. foreign entanglements. Now, many of my videos garnered hundreds of thousands of views, and within a little over a year, I hit 250,000 subscribers. And I'm not just tooting my own horn, I have a point to all of this. Everything with my channel was going incredibly well, almost too well. Viewers and people from other channels were suspicious I was somehow an agent of the deep state. While other channels and hosts were palling around with each other, very few paid me any attention. They thought. Oh, I want to get into that. Let me talk about this for just a second. Oh, I'm so glad she mentioned this, ladies and gentlemen. So some people may not realize this, but Kim actually had her own channel before she joined Rising. And it was called The Kim Iverson Show. I remember I, I actually, when did I find her channel? I found her channel was a couple years ago. It was one of the Bernie elections. <laughs> I forget which one, but it was one of the Bernie elections. And I was like, oh, great, a female that's doing this as well. Because during that time, there weren't as many women and the men kind of really dominated this space, right? That still kind of happens to a degree, but there are more women now. We do need more. Something that she said here that I thought was really interesting is that she brought up that her channel grew very quickly. And see, back then you could do that because there, wa there wasn't as much censorship on the left at that point in time. YouTube definitely hyped up, like ramped up their censorship. But back then, if you came out with your channel during one of the Bernie campaigns, you could grow pretty quickly. Actually, Jordan Sheraton talked about this when he came on as well. Uh, so the Bernie campaign really helped a lot of people like in this space during that time. And that's where I relied on getting progressive news because I wasn't getting the right message from mainstream media. Let's just be real, right? So- she grew very quickly and she went on to say that some people became suspicious thinking like, oh, she must have had some inside help or, you know, that kind of thing. And, and people do jump to those conclusions, which is unfortunate, especially if you're a female. They just tend to think that you're not doing this on your own, but they don't seem to question it when it's a male. And that's just something that I've noticed with, within this space. Because God forbid a woman have her own show and do this on her own and not have any political connection. You were not a candidate. You were not like a press secretary and you just did it on your own. So, you know, props to Kim for that. Because like I said, back then there weren't, <laughs> the women were far and few. And usually, like I said, when you see a woman hosting a show and left independent media, a lot of times she's paired with a guy. But Kim had her own show. So I got to give her props for that. Got to give her mad props for that. But people were suspicious because she was growing so fast. And what people may not know is that she came from radio. So she had experience like doing this. So she knew what she was doing. So then she went on to say that she had no help. She did it all on her own. 
And I want to speak to that for just a second before I get into what happened with her channel. I really know what that is like. Some of you may not realize this, but before I joined RBN, I actually already had my own channel. I started last year. The first person that I brought on was uh, Torn Walker. He came on to talk about progressive voting. I think Rome was second. Jen Perlman might have been after Rome. And then Marianne Williamson was one of my early, early, early on guests. And she came on and talked about uh, reparations. So one thing I can tell you is that when you do it on your own, it is, it's difficult. I'm not going to lie to you, especially if you don't know anybody, you have no connections in this space. It is very difficult, but there is something very, they're very, uh, rewarding about doing it on your own. Because when you look back on everything, you'll be able to say like, yeah, I did that. I put in all that work and that energy and look at where we are now. So there, there is a difference, I think. And then, you know, joining RBN, being a part of a network, there's a difference with that too. It's different because over at RBN, we kind of help out each other. But in the beginning, when I do like my show, I didn't have any help. I had no contacts. I didn't know anybody. I was basically starting from square one. So it was very, very difficult. Um, but just wanted to chime in about that because that is not something that is common on this space. So the fact that Kim was able to do that, especially back then, kudos to her for that. So I'll go back into the video here. There was no way my channel could grow as fast as it was without some inside help. But there wasn't any help. I did it all alone, sitting in a bedroom I had converted into a studio with a fabric backdrop, a ring light, and a starter DSLR. I did my own lighting, sound, filming, and editing. I was living with my family while I got the channel going, and Airbnb being my own apartment for cash. But after a while of grinding it out, my channel started to make money. By November of 2019, I was able to get back to living on my own. I started looking into hiring help. Then the pandemic hit. The focus of my attention and everyone else's shifted to the virus and lockdowns. I was against the lockdowns from day one. I argued they would result in a massive transfer of wealth, an unprecedented limitation of freedoms, and would only cause immense harm to children and others who are of low risk for the virus. I was also willing to discuss the lab leak theory. End of March of 2020 and into April, I made a few videos about the theory. One of my videos hit over a million views. Then suddenly, my video was removed by YouTube. They didn't have the same strike policy they have now. Instead, my channel suddenly went from explosive growth to zero growth, with my videos barely able to hit 10,000 views. So I went from 15 to 20,000 new subscribers per month to literally zero subscribers, not one. Very odd. This went on for months. In fact, my channel began losing subscribers, yet the content wasn't any different than the many radars you've seen me do here on Rising. I want to chime in here for a second as well. That happens. And I want to let you know, there have been people who have contacted me via email or DM and telling me that they were unsubscribed. If you're unsubscribed, this is a, a you know tip for all of you. If you find that you're unsubscribed from my channel, that is not me. I don't even know how to unsubscribe people. I really don't. I don't even think I can, to be honest with you. But that is not me. And Robert Durden is very good at this when it comes to YouTube analytics. He describes it very well. And one of the things that he mentioned is that every time people get over a thousand. So when I went from 10,000 to 11,000, which happened pretty quick, actually, what YouTube will do is they will actually remove a few of them. And I only knew it was YouTube doing it because you guys contacted me and told me that you were unsubscribed and you didn't do it. And I didn't do it. At one point, I remember YouTube unsubscribed my best friend. <laughs> they unsubscribed my best friend. She was like, what the hell? I was like, don't look at me. It wasn't me. So this does happen. And what Kim is describing to you, the fact that because she talked about a subject that is rather controversial, that they didn't want her discussing uh, on here, they decided, you know what, let's make it so that she cannot gain any subscribers. And she said that went on for months. Then she said they started to remove them. So just letting you know, 
This is a real thing. Let me go back into the video. There was one odd week in July of 2020 when the algorithm hit a glitch and I suddenly gained about 50,000 subscribers in a single week. Then boom, back to nothing. That one event con confirmed my suspicions that something was amiss. It wasn't that my views are unpopular with the people, they're just unpopular with the establishment. And I wasn't alone. Others reported having similar issues after reporting on the lab leak theory and criticizing lockdowns. They too saw their subscriber counts slow to a crawl at best and video view counts take a dive. But I trekked on. I found other ways to survive, but it took a long time for my channel to start to grow again. And now everyone is allowed to freely talk about the lab leak theory, so I was punished for something everyone can now talk about without consequence. And that's one of the biggest issues with this type of content curation. One week, something is misinformation. The next week, it's common discourse. I was hit a year later in April of 2021 for reporting on Johnson & Johnson's vaccine being halted, which ended up being temporary, and alleged side effects that were being reported in the news about other brands. I violated their medical misinformation policy. By this point, YouTube had implemented their strike system. First, you get a warning, then you get a strike and can't upload for a week. If you get another strike, you can't upload for two weeks. Because there were two videos in question, they gave me a warning and a strike and limited me from uploading for a week. But a couple of months later, after some of the side effects were confirmed by Pfizer and the FDA, I appealed the strike and had it reversed to a warning. I didn't get my week back, but I at least shielded my channel from getting hit harder in the future. Well, that future came last Friday when I woke up to a message from YouTube telling me a video was removed for violating their medical misinformation policy. This resulted in a strike and I'm now suspended for posting for a week. Specifically, I violated their policy surrounding ivermectin. It is against YouTube's policy to post any content that claims ivermectin is either safe or effective in the treatment of COVID-19 or goes against the WHO. So I'm now in the doghouse or horse stable, if you will. Now, I'm lucky that I've had the opportunity to come here to the Hill, where I've had a platform. Many other independent creators have had to give up and find new lines of work. People who are genuinely good at this job, who are trying to share information with the world, are being cut out using a variety of tactics, from algorithmic suppression to outright bans. Information is being limited to only that which is sanctioned by the state. Private companies can do what they want, but if they choose to only allow the state-sanctioned narrative to be heard, what has become of our culture? Good point. I want to chime in here for a second. So something that I do want to point out that I think we really need to pay close attention to. It used to be when YouTube came after channels for this type of information, it was usually the smaller channels because we don't make as much money for YouTube as someone who has like a million subscribers, right? So I don't make as much money for YouTube as Majority Report or as David Pakman, right? But now... Now they're starting to hit the larger channels. So I just told you about a week ago, the Hill rising, they were hit. Now Kim's hit. I think Kim has over 300,000 subscribers on her own channel. So this is concerning because this really means that no one is safe. And at one point I thought, hey, you know, the larger channels, they're going to be safe regardless. One you need to watch out for, and I think I might do a special episode for this. If you have not been paying attention, Jimmy Dore is about to hit 1 million subs. Pay close attention to that number. Because I have a theory, I could be wrong, but I have a theory that once he gets to 999, I have a theory that YouTube is going to start removing subscribers from him, or they're going to stall him so he doesn't hit the 1 million mark. Now, I could be wrong. I hope that I am. But pay close attention because JB and I, we've been watching this and we had bets on this man. We really did. Like, oh, Jimmy's going to hit 1 million by this date. We had bets on it. So he has been getting like over 1,000 subs a day. I think it was just a couple days ago. I told my husband, like, holy crap, Jimmy Dore has 995,000 subscribers now. He was growing like boom, 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 right? But like I told you, what they'll do, the closer that you get to that milestone, they'll start to slow you down. They'll remove numbers from you to stop you from hitting that mark, especially if you are further on the left, especially if you are not speaking these mainstream media talking points. They're really going to want to try to stop you. There's a reason why someone like David Pakman easily got over a million subs. 
There's a reason why TYT has over a million subs. You got to think about the fact that they're on the corporate algorithm. They have sponsors. They mention their sponsors in their videos multiple times. And that's something I, I, I've told you guys like in the beginning, multiple companies have contacted me for sponsorships. And every time I tell them no, because usually when you take that, there are certain agreements that go along with that. And you have to read these contracts very carefully. You may have to change your messaging. And I don't want to have to do that. I want to be able to be myself. So pay close attention to that, you guys. Because I've been watching. And, and this is what they do. So uh, poor Kim has been hit with this. And I'll, I'll tell you one thing. If you've talked to Kit over at Hardlands Media, they've had to deal with this as well. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. Once you get like a strike on your channel, they really, really, really start to suppress you. They really come after you. If you get demonetized, they really stop your growth. Pay attention to the people who came out a couple years ago that were growing like crazy. Convo Couch, Nico House, uh, Jamal Thomas. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. I'm looking for the smaller ones. Um, well, recently, Frank Analysis. They should have way more subscribers than what they have right now. Way more. And again, like I said, with the censorship and, you know, they got demonetized and all of that stuff. When that happens, it really, really slows you down. And every time you may get like subscribers, they'll just pull them from you. And Franco's talked about this before. Like he'll get 10, they'll remove five. So it's, it's really unfortunate. It sucks. And I don't agree with censorship. I think we should be able to say what we want. And if people don't agree with it, they don't have to watch us. But this, this tone policing and you have to say this this way and you can't talk about this and anything can, can be considered, uh, you know, unsuitable content for advertisers. Anything, if you look at the list that they have for YouTube, anything. They don't want you to talk about like firearms. Like they don't want you to talk about, obviously you can't really talk about the pandemic. Like Kim was just telling you, they don't want you to really talk about, uh, violence or it. They want you to talk about your puppies. And I think that's just ridiculous. And I think it's hypocritical because they have those rules, but they don't apply to everybody. It doesn't apply to TYT. Let's be real. So it's, it's a problem. Eric said, this content may be unsuitable for normies, right? So it's an issue. It's a problem. Hopefully this does not, you know, affect Kim's like channel, but from what I've seen from other people that this has happened to, it has affected their channel. Someone that you really should be looking towards is unapologetic. Also known as Don tell his channel is unapologetic on YouTube. They've done the same thing to him. And it's really, really frustrating because he is very knowledgeable about foreign policy. He also writes for Substack and they suppress him so damn hard. It's almost impossible to find him. And that's why I ask you guys, and I, I used to do this and I stopped doing it. So I'm going to start doing this again. If you are new to my channel, please put in the comment section, tell me how you found me. Because that is actually really helpful for me. I know some of you did that like back in the day when I was asking people like, how did you find me? It seems like a lot of people found me from Jimmy Dore from based on what I, I had like a whole spreadsheet of this, by the way. I used to keep track of this to see how people were finding me. But it seemed like a lot of people found me from Jimmy. But however you found me, let me know if you're new, because that really helps me understand where my videos are popping up. I'm gonna go back into the video for a little bit. Are we a free America, open to hear all sides of arguments, no matter how absurd or how much we disagree? Or are we one of a, nar of a, are we one, of a one narrative nation governed by Big Brother? We need to decide and we need to demand. But my fear is it's already been decided and demanded and unfortunately not in the favor of free speech and free thought. And that is my biggest concern with our culture now of censorship. We've developed this new culture and it's going on on both sides. We do see from the left, this censorship of you know don't of what they've determined to be science or morality 
Uh, if you go against that, that's misinformation. You should be deplatformed. You should be silenced. You should be canceled. I see it coming from the right as well, where there was actually a school district in Virginia talking about burning books that they didn't agree with. They actually mentioned, mm -hmm. well, we should burn these books. Um, and it was about, um, you know, uh, critical race theory books or books for LGBTQ type issues and or stories involving gay teenagers. So w we've kind of reached this point in society where and maybe we've always been in it. I've just never really yeah, experienced it in enough. But it does feel like we are at a point where everybody seems to be OK to some degree with censorship. And we're allowing yep. these private companies to get away with it. And we're even encouraging it and saying, well, yeah, but you did X, Y, Z thing and you shouldn't have or you shouldn't be allowed to read this book. And I'm of the opinion that, you know, I'm, I'm more of a free speech absolutist. I actually I, I, I'm actually fairly extreme about it, but um, because I don't think there's really any speech that should be banned, including maybe even yelling fire in a theater and saying, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, you should look around and see if the fire is out. I, I get it. People are going to disagree with me on that. But at well, least, even that, you know, that anecdote is, is, uh, is so people say that a lot. Well, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. But it's actually what that statement comes from is a is a a like a, a, a Supreme Court opinion that was not even I think it was I think it was the dissent. Uh. Uh, so it's not there's no legal standard that says that it's something that people say. But it's not like just as you say, if there is a fire in the movie theater, you are supposed to yell fire. Right. And, and in fact, that that decision was being <laughs> used to, you know, it was the majority decision, excuse me, but it was later uh, invalidated that precedent. But that was the precedent to to prohibit leaflets uh, against World War One from being distributed. So that metaphor was supposed to be like be, saying something against the war, sapping the war effort was like yelling, falsely yelling fire in a crowded theater, which is which we would not right. accept. Right. Even even the most pro censorship person today would not say you are not allowed to distribute leaflets arguing against some some war. Although so I don't know. These maybe days, we're I mean, getting there. But. Well, it seems like it. If you say anything against this war that's going on between Russia and Ukraine, you know, suddenly you're being accused of being a, right. a you know, I'm accused all the time of carrying yep. Putin's vodka around or whatever yep. it might be. But, you know, people aren't able to say what they want and that and that it, and people are being accused. So I don't know. Maybe our culture has reached back to the McCarthy era or. Well, you can certainly see, sense in today's environment how people like Eugene Debs would like. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and come out of this video, but yeah, it's a problem. It's a big problem. And I think that people who are independent journalists, independent commentators, people need to be able to pay a, to, to make a living. Like this stuff is not cheap to do. I think I've explained this to you guys before. Like everything I use costs money. Like the streaming service I use StreamYard, this costs money every month. Like the ring lights, everything I have, those things cost. My camera was like $200 and, and this isn't even the best camera. I'm just, gonna be, I'm just going to be like honest with you the the, the tools that I use to create my thumbnails that cost money every month. Like this isn't free to do. And especially if you're doing like research and you're trying to get that information as well. Uh, it's not free. <laughs> let's just <laughs> let's just put it that way. It's not free. Now I was lucky enough that I had a job, so I was able to take money from that job to at least get me up going, get me started, right? But not everybody has that. And if you have a voice and you have something that you want to say and you just want to pick up the camera and just go ahead and start talking, people should be able to do that. But again, everything costs money. Everything costs money. But what Kim is talking about here, it is very problematic. And if this continues, I see a boycott coming in the future. And the fact that they were able to suspend the Hill like that on YouTube, that is should be a big sign and a red flag to everyone. And I've said this before, and I'll tell you again, guys, you need to get on multiple platforms. All my videos are backed up. So you can't just like, like I said, sign up for my, my newsletter. It's pinned. It should be pinned to the top of this live chat. Sign up for my newsletter so you can get alerts every time I go live and it gives me your email address. So I have an email list. So if any time they decide, look, we're shutting all of you guys down. I have a way to contact you and say, Hey, come follow me on this platform. You see what I'm saying? 
So I, I sincerely hope uh, other people are doing that. And if you're watching this and you're a commentator, I highly recommend that you start an email list. It is what it is. But it's really frustrating because we put in a lot of work. Like I watch a lot of videos. I read a lot of articles, a lot of articles. And sometimes I have to read like three or four articles about one story just so I can find an article that is not going to be biased. It's that difficult. So we put in a lot of work to do this and to see them just remove your work, your content. I'm talking going years back. Some people are being penalized for videos that they put up three years ago. They're just now being penalized for. It's ridiculous. I'm going to go to some of the comments and then I'll go into the next story. Thank you so much for the super chat, Delthea Simmons. mf -er is a cuss word. Billionaire is an obscene word. Don't get it twisted. Oh, mm. well said. Well said. Delthea also said social media is going to have to nationalize, period. Pat said, I was born right at the time when McCarthyism ended. I remember hearing of the horrible damage it did to our country. This is so depressing to have it happening again. You know, anytime they try to silence voices, what kind of country do we live in? What happened to freedom of speech, freedom of expression? What happened to all that? What happened to the right to protest? The right to assembly? Do the Bill of Rights, does that not matter anymore? It's very concerning. All of us should be concerned. So follow me on Rockfin. I'm also on Odyssey, although I don't go in there much. I forget why. Oh, yeah, I forgot my password. But anyway, my videos sync up over there. <laughs> Story of my life. I'm always forgetting passwords. Um, and also, you know, follow me on Spotify. I'm on there, too. I'm also on iHeartRadio. Follow me on Facebook because all of my live streams, I also post them on Facebook as well. So all of my links are included in the details description of each video. So. Yeah, man, I I'm getting very concerned and very like worried. This is scary. It's a scary time. Thank you for the super chat, Troy at Sabby Sabs. Open an account in Odyssey and sync your YouTube channel to it, please. Yeah, I'm on there. Just go to Odyssey and type in Sabby Sabs, even if I can't because I forgot my password. <laughs> but I have to get I have to get back to them with that. It's something I've been meaning to do that I never got around to. Story of my life, story of my life. All right. I want to go ahead and get into the second story. So <laughs> Bill Maher recently had an interview with Ben Shapiro and uh, Sam Cedar didn't like that too much. And he had something to say about it. Now we'll go ahead and say, I'm not a fan of Bill Maher. I'm not. I think he flip flops polit um, politically. I know sometimes people do change as they get older. I get it. I understand that. But I think that Bill Maher to me has said some pretty asinine things. I don't think he's really a serious person politically. I think he says the things that get him clout and get him attention. That's what I think of Bill Maher. And I didn't used to feel that way about him. When I was a liberal, I thought Bill Maher was pretty left. I thought he was pretty left. I don't feel that way so much anymore. So check this out. This is from Majority Report. Sam Cedar had some things to say about Bill Maher's appearance on Ben Shapiro's show. Like I said, he was not a fan of this. <laughs> so here we go. Bill Maher went on to the Ben Shapiro show. I tell you, Bill Maher has has always been a bit of a libertarian and um he you know his show was politically incorrect and he was sort of that was the, the show that really launched him and it really was about being like you know the old white guy um id in responding to a new generation of emancipation that was taking place in the nineties. Politically correct was 
the term started as a way for college students, I think in like the 90s, to assess whether they want to date somebody. It was, it was, it was a jokey term. It was a jokey term. And then it was adopted by the right more than it was by the left. I imagine that drove them pretty crazy to talk about pretty being crazy. disqualified from dating. Right. This was the nineties were very like, it was a different time. And it was like when we had come out of the Reagan era, homophobia was beginning to become less acceptable. And I, I phrase it that way specifically. I don't, I don't know how much people appreciate like how bad it was in the eighties and the nineties because like, you know, in the seventies and the sixties and the fifties, people pretended like it didn't exist. And the, you know, the homophobia was just like so it was almost like so baked into society that it didn't you did, there was no name for homophobia i think probably at that time sam get then to the, the point so i just it okay you know i used to watch majority report for michael brooks i thought michael brooks was pretty cool he just seemed a little bit more chill you know Sam Cedar, when he speaks sometimes, he reminds me of a history professor I had in undergrad. That's what he reminds me of. He stand up in front of the class, give his lecture, half the people in the back asleep, people in the front, the few in the front sitting straight up because they don't want to fall asleep. Those of us in the middle trying to decide if we're going to put our head down or keep our head up. But that's what he reminds me of like when he's speaking, just like, in 1975, there was a conflict that um, it happened around the time of, and the whole time we're sitting in class, we're like, dude, just get to the point. Just, just bring it on, reel it on in. I'm going to fast forward a little bit here. I'm going to fast. Oh, that was a terrible place to pause this video. I'm so sorry. <laughs> let me, let me get to the point here. Okay. E right about here. Here we go. liberal on some issues but um you know dude's gotta get wants to get re-upped on that show wants to be in the the limelight here he is on the ben shapiro show um but when you say woke you know it's become and i make fun of it too because it's become an eye roll in many ways if woke i assume at a certain moment and it wasn't that long ago before we didn't have the term I only heard it, I don't know what, it was three, four years ago, five years ago at most when we heard the term woke and it was like alert to injustice. I'm like, okay, I'm down with that. I always have been. I hope people still understand that about me. But yes, it became sort of a byword for a lot of this goofy stuff. That's what I'm always railing against. That's why like they play me on Fox News now. Yeah, I mean, you know? how do you feel about that? Because you, you went from well, the guy who was... <laughs> I, I, I feel... Look, I'm, I haven't changed at all. My <laughs> politics haven't changed. They've changed. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> yes, he has. Yes, he has. I think I brought this up on the stream one time before. Um, oh, I'll finish the video. But I think I brought this up on the stream one time before where I was reading his bio and it talked about all the different political phases that he had. So his politics really have changed. Like he he goes back and forth on different things. Um, that that was a funny comment for him to make. My politics really haven't changed. Yes, they have. I used to watch that show, Politically Incorrect. It is definitely he is definitely changed. Definitely changed. Now don't get me wrong. I personally don't care if someone goes on to Ben Shapiro's show or Tucker Carlson's show. I don't care. I think if you're on the left and they invite you on, I think you should come on so you can get your message across to as many people as possible. Hell, do you think if Tucker Carlson contacted me and said, hey, Sabby, would you come on and talk about health care? Would you come on and talk about student loan debt? Would you come on and talk about the wealth inequality? Fuck yeah, I would go. I got a lot to say about the class divide. You think I wouldn't get take that chance to deliver that message to over 5 million people. 
That's how many people watch his show. Over 5 million people. I would tell everybody, listen, this is what's really going on. The two-party system is a joke. They're both controlled by Wall Street. Everybody get together. We need to bring the working class together. We need to hit the streets and rise up. Fuck yeah, I'd go. So I, I hope that Sam Cedar is not upset that he went on Ben Shapiro's show. That's that's just my take on that. I have no issue with people doing that. You got to reach as many people as possible. And there are not that many people on the left. And some have strayed. Let's just be real. Let me go back into the video. People say to me sometimes, you know, have you changed? No. It's, it's that five years ago, no one was talking about defunding the police. I never heard that phrase five years ago. That's not me changing. That's things changing. I'm reacting to it, as I've always been. Um, you know, letting three-year-olds decide what gender they are. This wasn't something five years ago. Pause it. Pause it for a second. First off, keep fighting for that injustice um, by protecting uh, the police, which I think there is no possible metric in the world no possible possible metric that exists that can tell you that the police, the policing in this country has brought about justice. There's no metric. If you're, if you're talking about justice in terms of social justice, in terms of like, are there specific people who are subjected to different treatment from police? There is no possible metric. It's a big drug legalization guy. He doesn't have to go far in his canon to find this, uh, this, this information. And oh my God. I can't believe I'm about to say this. I actually agree with Sam Cedar on that point. I can't believe I actually agree. I actually agree with him on that point when it comes to policing. He's right about that. He's right about that. And you don't know how much it pains me to say that. My stomach is like doing that little turning thing that it does when I get nervous. But he's right about that. Now, I think he goes on to discuss the woke issue as well, which is what I also want to focus on. So let's listen to this as well. And if you're going to like, you know, you don't like the slogan, fine. But to pretend like I don't understand what this means or what it's what it's about, and this is brand new, and this and that, like, you know, I don't know. I think there's been people who have a problem with the police. Yeah, I think I remember a phrase called fuck the police from the 1990s. Uh, I remember a, a phrase like, hey, pigs, that type of thing. Like, that's not a new term. I don't think that was a term all of, of sudden, endearment. All of a sudden, like, people started disrespecting police. Yeah, that's very strange. And then... No, um, oh my God, ice tea. Someone let me know in the chat if I got the right ice. I believe it was Ice-T. Didn't he have a song called Cop Killer? That was like decades ago. So I'm not sure what Bill Maher is talking about. I'm not sure. It is interesting, though. I, I do agree with Sam's point here about the police, but it is kind of funny, though, because I didn't feel like he took a strong stance when it came to defunding the police. So I don't know, but I don't know. I see Ice Cube and Ice-T. Too many ices. I'll look it up. This idea of like, hey, five years ago, the idea of 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 letting kids choose their gender was not a thing. Do you know what else uh, wasn't happening 10 years ago or 12 years ago? That was the right of gay people to marry. In fact, 15 years ago, you'll recall uh, Bill Maher, or maybe it was like uh, 16 or 17 years ago, the president of the country wanted to amend the Constitution to prevent people from marrying people of the same sex. Mm. I mean, there was a time where there was never, ever, ever, ever a black woman who sat on the Supreme Court. Stop, oh, wait, that Sam, time is now. Stop. And hopefully no, in six stop, months, that won't be the case. Stop. Nope, you lost me there, Sam. See, now I'm gone. Now I'm gone. Now you lost me. Okay, okay. I get what he's saying about a three-year-old, you know, questioning their gender. I have, have never been in that situation or put in that position. I've never, I don't know what that feels like. I don't know what that's like. 
even if I have a friend or a colleague that is transgender, I actually don't know what that experience is like. Um, and I think that it was kind of unfair for Bill Maher to make that statement. Like, how do you know how that child feels? I watched a documentary one time where it was a little girl and she felt that way. Elementary school, very young. And her parents were trying to make her be a girl. And they were trying to make her wear dresses and all this. And she was just like, that's not who I am. And like, she just kept crying and bawling. And so finally they let her be a little boy and she was happy. So again, I don't have kids. I have not been in that situation, but again, like, how does he know what that child feels like? So I think Bill Maher was wrong on that. Now, Sam, for Sam Cedar to come, like, why did he have to throw in the, we've, you know, never had a black woman on the Supreme. Gosh, damn it. I hate that. I hate it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Because it's not just about putting a black woman on the Supreme Court. It's about putting someone on the Supreme Court that is qualified to be there and that is actually going to help the people. And the people that have been chosen by Joe Biden, by Jim Clyburn, by Lindsey Graham, they, if you look at their record and their history, they are no better than Kamala Harris. They have fought in their careers to help corporations, to protect corporations. They did not work for the people. They didn't help the people. And so people like Sam Cedar and Joe Biden and everybody else on national television want you to buy into this virtue signaling that you should be happy. They might put a black woman on the Supreme Court and they won't even tell you what she did. And it's wrong. And I'm tired of it. And I'm not the only black person that's tired of it. Other black people getting tired of it too, man. They did this with Obama. They continue to virtue signal to us. So you lost me on the black woman on the Supreme Court, Sam. You lost me on that. I'm going to go back into the video. I mean, this idea that they changed. Who's the they? Like, what is the they that's going on here? Wokeism is no different than politically correct. You had a show that was called Politically Incorrect. You've always been an ass. <laughs> now. And to some extent, he's accurate about that. But it's like the, the idea that like we're progressing to the point where we're getting more enlightened about things. Yeah, I, this reminds me of like well, one of the, the negative experiences I remember from my childhood, um, which is the first time I was ever came across a trans person in real life. And that was sort of understood that that was going on. So me and some kids in like fifth grade traveled to D. I'm going to fast forward here because I can never see that individual talking. So that's that three-year-olds and and no one is but the idea that you can't let a three-year-old identify and because look i, I mean i know of instances where three-year-olds four-year-olds five-year-olds have said to their parents like i, I want to be a girl i want to be a boy and then a couple years later they didn't and a couple years later they 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 continued I mean, like, where's the harm in this? I, and I think there is demonstrated harm of you know forcing people into these specific two slots, blue and pink, that we need to force that these people want to continue forcing people into. This dude, honestly, was yeah, like, they were dude. making parodies of this guy fifty years ago. And like, just listen to the song of "All in the Family," right? Boys were boys, and men and, and girls were girls, or whatever it is. What? Continue. Decide what gender they are. This wasn't something five years ago. Free speech, you know, used to be a, a left wing thing that we were proud and owned. And now that seems to be under attack. So, again, I'm, I think I've. He's right. Is there about any that. more to this? Uh, oh, I play the next clip, too. Unbelievable. This dude. Free no. speech. I can't even do any of my, some of my, like my best material anymore. No, I'm sorry. No, uh, Bill is actually right about that one. I just told you what's been happening to people. I told you what happened to Kim Iverson. Lee Camp told you what happened to him. Tara Reid, all these people being censored. So the free speech thing, Bill Maher, I think is right about that. He's like, that used to be a left thing. And now it's like, now, even on the left, you got people who say they're lefties trying to cancel other lefties. They don't want them to talk about stuff. It, 
it's just, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. We can't have a difference of opinion anymore. People want people to shut them down. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm understanding both sides of this conversation. Uh, and I will give credit to where credit's due. I think Bill Maher is right on that issue when he's talking about the free speech issue. So let me go back in. <laughs> See, he said, dude. <laughs> On, on the climate change thing, if if the proposals were for seawalls from the Republican Party and not this snowball means there's no global warming, then you'd be <laughs> <laughs> then then you you'd be in the ballpark. Yeah, I also think we could lead more. I, I I'm maybe I'm wrong, but I do think if we if we took the lead, if we planted our flag on the ground and said we're doing this, uh, I think you can get people. I think you can shame people a little bit. Now I understand it's very hard to. Um, can you still use? The term third world, or is that bad? I do. I mean, <laughs> well, that's right. I'm <laughs> right. right. <laughs> okay, well, it's bad. Developing I'm... world. Which nation are we talking <laughs> about here? Right? Are we talking about are we talking about nations that well, where people are burning dung for fuel? Because, I mean, right. by, by the way, we should mention that when it comes to green energy, it's very easy for first world people to care a lot about solar panels. But right. when you're burning dung for no, fuel in Africa, that makes it very, very difficult for you to care. But what I'm saying is third Uh-oh. world. Okay, places that have not had air conditioning, places that have not had cars okay and now they finally are getting them Mm -hmm. it's very hard to say to them look we have been enjoying these things for quite a long time now you stop that right now (laughs) wait a minute bill there's places right here in boston that don't have air conditioning (laughs) that probably wasn't a good example there's places when i lived in new york there's buildings in new york that didn't have air conditioning there were buildings in dc that didn't have air conditioning so maybe use a a different example but not that one (laughs) i'm just saying oh don't get me started on the ac don't do it don't do it (laughs) (laughs) now bad timing yeah (laughs) bad timing for you you have to forego these things uh yeah, so I, I take your point. It's going to be very hard for India and China. But I mean, they're not stupid. I mean, they must understand that what goes it to win the economic race if you can't breathe? I well, mean, but I, the I, I, air in Beijing, don't they sometimes have to like take drastic measures oh, because yeah. you can't breathe there? Well, then the nice thing about being a communist dictatorship is that a few more people die, you know, what's a few more beans more or less is, is the nice thing about being a what? what the hell are these guys talking about? This is like completely gone off the rails. They're trying to agree, even though like Bill Maher this, this supposedly has a different this, position. This on is what's so change. gross about this interview. Okay, this is so much of like Bill Maher basically saying like my audience has just completely dropped out. And that's fine. Look, we go through ebbs and flows with our audience on this program. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys think that Sam wanted to be in that interview with Ben instead? Let me know. Let me know. Let me know, guys. Let me know. Like, honestly, I don't really, I don't care that that he's talking to Ben Shapiro. But Sam seems to be really bothered by this. Really bothered. And one thing I forgot to mention that I do want to bring up. It's really interesting in reference to the virtue signaling because Sam Cedar brought that up, not me. That was really interesting that he brought up the black woman on the Supreme Court thing and he brought up the whole policing issue and how it affects certain people more than others. Because through all of his his statement there, this is the same person that didn't want to debate a black commentator. Don't want to debate Nick on RBN. Don't want to debate Nico House. What? It's coastal elites, man. Those coastal elites. <laughs> oh I'm going to write a book about that one day. The liberal coastal elites. The ones that pretend that they care when they really don't. <laughs> they really don't. Any chance they get, they'll hold a black person back. What? Let's go back in. What happens? But he is so desperately trying to um, to cater to a different audience that he is sitting across from someone who represents fundamentally. If there is one thing that has been Bill Maher's bailiwick 
over the 15, 25 years that he has been in, uh, you know, in a political social commentator, if there is one thing that has defined his career, it is his complete and utter disdain for religion. And he's literally sitting across from as close as you can get to a Jewish theocrat in this country. So about what? this country. So what? Who cares? Who cares? This is something that I tell you guys often on this show. I think we need to talk to people that we don't agree with. How boring is it if I bring on people that agree with me on everything all the time? You need to talk to people that have different political ideologies than you, that have a different religion than you. You need to talk to people that don't agree with everything that you agree on. What's wrong with that? So what? Who cares? I don't care. Bill Maher doesn't like religion. Okay, cool. That means he can't talk to Ben Shapiro on anything about anything. That's a bit much, right? That's a bit much. This is why we can't come together in this country and like actually fight. This is why we can't come together and actually lead some type of a movement. Because you have people in this space that only want people on the left to stay on the left and only talk to people on the left. And if you're right, stay on the right and only talk to people on the right. And for those of you in the middle, you're just screwed. That's a big problem. How will you ever know if you have certain issues that you do agree on with someone on the other side if you don't talk to them? Guys, I worked in education. I was an academic advisor. I had to talk to everybody. I had to talk to students that were Trump supporters. I had to talk to students that liked Joe Biden. There were very few of those though. I had to talk to people that didn't agree with me politically. They didn't agree with me when it came to religion. They didn't agree with me on some racial issues. But as an academic advisor, I had to talk to everyone who came through my door. Do you see what I mean? So I think, I just think he's really angry that Bill Maher went on there and he's not on there. Just let it go, bro. Let it go. Really? Just, you should be able to talk to anybody. You should be able to talk to anyone. I told you guys this before. Everyone that comes on here, I don't agree with on everything. I may not even agree with them on half the things that they talk about. Doesn't mean I'm not going to talk to them. Let's pop out of this video. I'm going to leave Sam's face like that. Let's go. Let's go. So, yeah, like, that's my thing. Like, I understand where both sides were coming from. But to me, it just kind of came across that he was more upset that he went on to that show. Now, they brought up the message of woke. And I do want to bring up the definition of woke because I feel like this term has been co-opted and it's been changed into so many different things. Anything is woke now. So let's go ahead and bring up that definition of woke. This is the definition of woke. The original definition. Woke. Here we go. Not the verb. We are looking at the adjective, which is what we're referring to here. Having or marked by an active awareness of systemic injustices and prejudices, especially those related to civil and human rights. That's it. That is actually the definition of woke. Somehow along the way, it has been co-opted and people tend to apply this to anything, any little thing and say, oh God, it's woke, run away. Oh no, that's woke, don't do that. Oh my God, don't talk about race, that's too woke. Jeez, don't talk about your religion. How dare you bring up transgender? That's too woke, it's too woke, 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 woke. This is what happens when liberals co-op terms. This is what happens when the Democratic Party co-ops terms. And a good example of this, Black Lives Matter. Look how watered down and commercialized that became after Democrats got a hold of it. It's frustrating to me. It's just frustrating, man. I see so many movements co-opted. 
so many different organizations just co-opted by people who take it over and they water it down. Thank you so much for the super chat, Colin. It's easier for Cedar to be right about the police because he will never get pulled over in fear for his life at their hands. 100%. That's true. That's true. Thank you for this super chat, Troy. Didn't NWA Easy e have a song called F the Police? Yes. Yes. Yeah, you're right. So I don't know what Bill Maher is talking about because the anti-police rhetoric has been around for a long time. Thank you for the super chat, Andrew. I'd rather watch the George Clooney Batman on loop than a Cedar and Shapiro interview. Oh man, that's rough. That's rough. Thank you so much for the super chat. Thank you for the super chat, Troy. Sabby, I'm following some lefties on Rumble too. Ooh, I have to check it out. I think the reason why I didn't sign up for it is it said something about in order to monetize, you have to give them permission of your YouTube videos. And I was like, what? So yeah, it was too much, man. Too much. Andrew Matthews, thanks for the super chat, said, I think I had the same professor. <laughs> A lot of us had that one professor or teacher that uh, just would put everybody to sleep. Thank you for this super chat as well. Liberals will counter with the right is pro censorship too. That may be but the right isn't in power right now. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. And I think, I think I got all of those. Okay. I want to go into my final story. Oh, geez, geez, geez. What can I say about the women at the view? So let's get into this. So Anna Navarro, one of the frequent hosts on The View. She's not an official host. I don't know why they won't make her official host. I don't know the story around that, but she's on there quite often. Uh, <laughs> she made a statement about Tucker Carlson and also Tulsi Gabbard. <laughs> she's really coming across sounding like a cop. And Sabby did not like that. And apparently Glenn Greenwald didn't like that either. Because he, he went on to call out Anna, I'm trying not to laugh. He went on to call out Anna Navarro in a tweet. He wasn't the only one. So I want to go ahead and start with the video first to show you what started all of this to begin with. But basically, long story short, the women of The View are not happy with Tucker Carlson's commentary about the crisis with Russia and Ukraine. They are also not happy with Tulsi Gabbard as well. So... Let's dive in, shall we? Let me skip all this jazz and let's get straight to the video. Flag propaganda. Here's what they've both been saying about the war. Mm. Take a look. Democrats in Washington have told you you have a patriotic duty to hate Vladimir Putin. It's not a suggestion, it's a mandate. Anything less than hatred for Putin is treason. Hating Putin has become the central purpose of America's foreign policy. Secret biolabs? Like the secret biolabs Ukraine definitely doesn't have? Ukraine has those? Yes, it does. There are. Uh, first and foremost, is he wrong? Whether you like him or not, and I'm not a fan, is he wrong? Have some of you also received the impression that they're trying to get people to hate Putin? I've kind of received that message. So is he wrong? This is something that I want people to try to do to remove the idea that you have about a person and focus on the facts. And if what they're saying is true, please just push aside the fact that you don't like them because I don't want that to sway your feeling one way or the other. They go on with Tulsi Gabbard. I cannot play her comment. I have to skip past it, unfortunately. YouTube is going to flag me if I play it. They might even pull it, to be honest with you. But you get the idea. So I'm going to go ahead and fast forward past this. Actually, I can play it because there's captions. Av? You okay. So this is what she says. Just read the captions, you guys. Like I said, I can't put this on here. 
Yeah. Again, is she wrong? Like, it just, this is what bothers me about this show. All right, so here we go. That could cost lives. So I'm just going to open it up to the table. What the hell is going on? <laughs> Is so it? I think Mitt Romney is absolutely right, by the way. So what this is, is the Russians are spreading propaganda to try to create a pretext for potentially using chemical weapons against the Ukrainians. Right. So what they're parroting, what Tucker Carlson parrots every night on Fox News, what Tulsi Gabbard is spreading, is actually helping Putin get away with criminal acts against innocent Ukrainian civilians. It's is it? Is that the impression that you guys get? What about the innocent people in Russia? Why are they only tell one side of the story? That's what bothers me. What I want people to remember when they watch the show, this show was called The View. It's not called The News. It's called The View. But the problem is people take it as news and they take it in that way and they'll go on and repeat those same talking points to their friends and family members as well. Let me get to the, uh, Anna Navarro's point because that's the one I really want to drive home. I don't even know who this woman is. Let's see. All right, here we go, right here. Wait, wait, Putin Tucker Tucker Carlson. Tucker. If there's a Tucker and Laura Ingram and, and Tulsi Gabbard, well, all of them. Well, listen, the Fox uh, board of directors should really step in. If they call themselves patriots and they, you know, it's not enough to be posting flags about Ukraine. There's a bunch of uh, folks on, on that board of directors list like, my friend Paul Ryan, who I wish will be would be weighing in and saying we cannot be Russian state TV, yeah. at but, least not every hour. But what's or the, I, I guess for me the question is what is in it for someone like Tucker Carlson, right? I money. Mean, is it is it money? It Who's paying be. him that money? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not making. Hold on, Sonny. No, 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 no. What's in it for all of you that are on the View? Who's paying you your money to have the talking points that you have? Who paid you guys to have the talking points that you had towards Bernie Sanders when he came on? Exaggerating, saying that we're going to take people's health insurance away from them. Who paid you guys to do that? What's in it for you? Oh, I can tell you guys if you don't want to answer this. And I say this as if they can actually hear me. They get book deals. All of them. I don't know if you guys know that or not. They get book deals. They get speaking engagements. So how are you going to call? <laughs> how are you going to call out Tucker Carlson and ask who's paying him when you are sitting here on ABC on The View and you're being paid to have a certain narrative as well? Really? Disney is paying them, Colin. I love it. I love it. I love it. Let me go back in. Oh, geez. Any allegations, but it's just, it doesn't make sense that he would do this kind of thing. I mean, he, he also says that the United States helped encourage the Russian invasion. He said the United States engineered a coup in Ukraine in the name of democracy. He, as we just mentioned, confirmed these Russian claims about bioweapons. Um, and he's characterizing this situation as a border dispute, right? A and so what is in it for him? I know that he's visited Moscow and other places. And you can tell me in my ear if I'm wrong about that. But I, I just don't understand what the um, impetus is. I hope, he's I, think... I hope he's planning to move to Moscow. <laughs> because uh, he's not going to be welcome here for much longer. I think. Uh... What? What does that sound like to you? Really, Joy? Did you guys hear what Joy just said? He's not going to be welcome here for much longer. You can't sit here. Really? What? Oh my God. Wow. I can't believe I used to watch the show. I really can't believe it. Let's go back in. 
Um, do his viewers like it? Do, 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 I, I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I, don't, want, I don't think the ratings support. have dropped at all. And look, I, I, but I think that's an incredibly relevant question. Yeah. And I think DOJ, in the same way that it is uh, setting up a task force to investigate oligarchs, should look into people who are Russian propagandists and shilling for Putin. That's being, if you are a foreign asset uh, to a dictator, mm -hmm. it should be investigated. In fact, I remember when Tulsi Gabbard, mm -hmm. and I even hate that we're discussing it because I think to myself, who is this woman? She's a, you know, she's no longer in Congress. She's a failed presidential candidate. Yeah. She only pra practically exists on Twitter. And the fact that we're giving her oxygen is what makes her relevant. That we're talking. Oh, no, she didn't. Listen to what she just said. Let's play this one more time because I got something to say about this. Let me go all the way back. Hold on. Mm -hmm. It should be investigated. In fact, I remember when Tulsi Gabbard, mm -hmm. and I even hate that we're discussing it because I think to myself, who is this woman? She's a, you know, she's no longer in Congress. She's a failed presidential candidate. Yeah. She only pra practically exists on Twitter. And the fact that we're giving her oxygen is what makes her relevant, that we're talking about her on hot topics. But on the other hand... Oh, my God. So she just said that about Tulsi Gabbard. Honey, I can say the same thing about Hillary Clinton. Who is that woman? She is a failed presidential candidate. She's always trying to stay relevant. Always writing another book. Popping up on shows like The View to remind you that she's still around. And to prevent any type of progress in this country for working class people and for poor people. What? She goes, who is this woman? Is she even relevant? I can say that about your friend, Hillary Clinton, boo, who seems to come on that show quite often. But she's not going to say that about Hillary Clinton because Hillary Clinton is a part of the Democratic establishment. Because Hillary Clinton fits the narrative for that show. Someone like Hillary Clinton will always be welcome onto The View because she has the message and the political ideology that the producers of that show want to put out on that show. Let's all remember what happened to Tulsi Gabbard when she came onto The View when she was running for president and the way they spoke to her and how they treated her. Called the woman names to her face. Do you see? Come on, Anna. Come on. I know you are not going to say... Say that about Hillary Clinton. Say that about her. Let's go back to the part where she said that he should be investigated. This just kills me. Here comes the cop. I think that's an incredibly relevant question. Yeah. And I think DOJ, in the same way that it is uh, setting up a task force to investigate oligarchs, should look into people who are Russian propagandists and shilling for Putin. That's being, if you are a foreign asset uh, to a dictator, mm -hmm. it should be investigated. In fact, I remember when Tulsi Gabbard, mm -hmm. and I even hate that we're discussing it because I think to myself, who is this woman? Anna Navarro is a cop. Here's Anna Navarro saying, I think he sh she wants him to be investigated. Now, there's someone who had something uh, very important to say about Anna's comment. I haven't seen if Tucker Carlson has replied, but I have seen someone else reply. And they really had some things to say about Anna. So Glenn Greenwald, he just wants to remind Anna Navarro of this. Anna Navarro got her start pressuring the U.S. Congress to fund Contra death squads in Nicaragua. Her father was a member. Under Trump, she constantly worked against her own government to benefit other countries and does so now. Let's go on. By her own reasoning, DOJ should investigate her. Let's finish this uh, tweet thread and then I'm going to show you the screenshots that he included here. He said, whenever a war starts, a huge number of the DC political and media class start calling on the government to investigate dissidents. 
and smearing journalists and activists who question U.S. government policy as traitors and foreign agents. It's always a sign things have turned very dark. Now, let's show the first images that he has here. Now, this is Anna Navarro. It is the law. Foreign Agents Registration Act is a law requiring persons engaged in domestic, political, or advocacy work on behalf of foreign principals to register with the Department of Justice and disclose their relationship activities and related financial compensation. That's Anna Navarro. But this is also Anna Navarro. My dad was a Contra. I'm grateful to RR for his support of freedom. At House 808, at Anna Navarro, you're kind of wrong, you're kind of young to be a true Reaganite. Again, these are her words. Not Glenn Greenwald's. My dad was a Contra. Say what? Let's go down to the other screenshots here. Anna Navarro calls on the DOJ to investigate Russian propagandists like Fox News' Tucker Carlson and former Representative Tulsi Gabbard for shilling for Putin. This woman kills me. Unpatriotic conservatives. Listen to this. I respect and admire the French who have been a far greater nation than we shall ever be. That is, if greatness means anything loftier than money and bombs. That's from Thomas Fleming from hard right, March 13th, 2003. From the very beginning of the war on terror, there has been dissent. And as the war has proceeded to Iraq, the dissent has grown more radical and more ferocious. Perhaps that was to be expected, but here is what never could have been. Some of the leading figures in this anti-war movement called themselves conservatives. These conservatives are rarely few in number, but their ambitions are large. They aspire to reinvent conservative ideology, the junk, the 50-year-old conservative commitment to defend American interests and values throughout the world, the commitment that inspired the founding of this magazine in favor of a fearful policy of ignoring threats and appeasing enemies. So I just want to remind everyone who is Anna Navarro to talk? Not one of those women on that panel pushed back on her. Not one. And that goes to tell me that at the end of the day, they all have the same narrative. Yes, one may be a little bit more to the right than the other, but they all follow a script. It's not how it used to be. When Rosie O'Donnell was on that show and she did not last long, Rosie O'Donnell was pretty vocal. I don't think producers like that too much. I think she went off script. Now one of them pushed back. What does that tell you? I believe Max Blumenthal also called out Anna as well. Um, I didn't pin that tweet, shoot balls. I forgot to pin it. Cause I think he pointed out something else. Let's see if I can find it really quick. I don't know. Max tweets a lot. So it might be, let me see. Oh boy. Max does tweet a lot. Too many tweets. I can't find it. Oh, I found it. Okay. All right. Let me show you. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen really quick because uh, Max commented on this as well. So here's Max's comment. He said, Contra cheerleader Anna Navarro was herself a registered foreign agent for the government of El Salvador, making a fortune from an impoverished country, an impoverished country run by a deeply corrupt party 
founded by a death squad later nicknamed Blowtorch Bob. And here's the receipts. Invoice for professional services. So this was in 2007. This invoice covers professional services rendered in association with Greenberg uh, Traurig on behalf of the government of El Salvador and is for, excuse me, and is for the period of time between June 1st through December 31st, 2007. That's a lot of money. $158,000. $158,000. Wow. Damn. Max with the receipts. So yeah. This is how far this is, has gone, you guys. This is how far this has gone. Now they're trying to play cop. You should imprison that person for having those talking points. It really does bring people back to a McCarthy era. How dare you say those words? We must imprison. You must be arrested. We must investigate you. Now, I'm not here to defend Tucker Carlson. I'm not a fan of Tucker Carlson. There's a lot of things that he says that I do not agree with at all. But again, I told you guys, I don't agree with censorship, period. And I think Anna's being ridiculous. I think she's being dramatic. And I think she is also coming across like a hypocrite. But again, no one on that show checked her. I'm going to take these super chats really quick. Thank you so much for the super chat, Colin. They are pushing us to hate Putin more, so we will hate Biden less, right? It's not working for me, though. <laughs> it is not working for me, man. And thank you for the super chat, Mike. First time watching your show. Thanks for your clarity and insightful perspective. I'm now a subscriber. Thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate that. All right. Reef, two plus years of work on Discord can just be pulled like that. Same with YouTube. Time is the worst expense we spend and to have it wasted is a bummer. Yes, I mentioned this a couple days ago. For those of you who are new, uh, some people did have their Discord accounts also uh, removed people that are in the independent media space. So it's not just YouTube. It's happening in other places as well. I'll take those rock fin comments, Eric. It's the rock to the fin. It's the rock to the fin. Thanks so much for the tips on rock fin. Roger Meadows, RIP razor Ramon. What? Razor Ramon, the wrestler. No. Oh my gosh, I have to look that up. I'm so sorry. Also, West End looks, West End look, oh, let me see. Also, West End looks was Bruce Wayne. Didn't like the cheesy take on Batman, but understand the time with an outgrowth of McCarthy era hit the comic book genre as well. They didn't want to ruffle feathers. Keaton looked nothing like Bruce. But that was a return back to the original Dark Knight before McCarthy. But it's not about who can play Batman. You can get a stunt person, but who can play Bruce Wayne? YouTube unsubbing. I asked other YouTube hosts, but they forget to ask their viewers. I've been subbed to and have been subscribed to a whole bunch of YouTube shows. And I hear them say viewers tell them they've unsubbed yet. YouTube never done that to me. I have a theory. I have a Samsung with Google OS who's owned by Alphabet and Google owns YouTube. Do unsubbed viewers. I can't see the rest. Okay. Do unsubbed viewers have iPhones? I don't know. And that's a good question. It's why I always send rock not to YouTube. I refuse to fund your censoring. I remember Hannity losing his mind about Common doing spoken word at Obama White House, calling him a gangster rapper. First, not only was he not a gangster rapper, he was more Black Panther aligned, even though, oh, sorry, I lost my space, my spot. Um, even though that scared Hannity even more, yet Hannity forgets Bush Sr. hosted Easy e and NWA of F the Police fame at the White House. Yes, he sure did. Oh my God. 
Bush Sr. was, oh my God, I have to pull that up for you guys sometime. I forgot about that. Also, Sab, regarding police, how you like that video regarding what the guy from Legal Aid Society said that even with the most watered down, tepid elimination of qualified immunity in New York City, that NYPD Union President Patrick Lynch said, yes, that is his last name, Lynch, put the memo out to show restraint when dealing with the public. Also, progressive is the new watered down word. Millennials said woke, Gen X called it conscious. Good points. Yes, I did see that video. I did see that. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Greg Bruce says still a war criminal. <laughs> Greg says, look, just because uh, Bush Sr. hosted NWA, he gets no pass from me. <laughs> good points. Good points. Um, Reefer after doc said, yeah, Robert is amazing. And in the house, Robert was here. Oh, I didn't see it. I was talking too much. My bad, my bad. Yes, yes, yes. All right, guys, it is now 8 30 PM. So I'm going to head out, hop on over to revolutionary blackout network. I think Nick is doing a stream. Something about the outside looking in. I, I couldn't, I forget the whole title, but something about outside view or something like that. So definitely um, hop over to RBN and see what Nick's got going on over there. Um, I'm heading out. It's 8.30. That's my time. I'll be back again tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Cynthia McKinney will be here for reals this time. I got the days mixed up last week. That was on me. But um, we are going to have a pretty in-depth discussion. Cynthia McKinney was a congresswoman. Uh, she left the Democratic Party. She went with the Greens. Uh, she has a lot to say. And I think she's a, uh, a very knowledgeable person and a voice that more people need to hear because she has experience working within the duopoly and leaving the duopoly. And she talks about that experience a lot. So Cynthia McKinney is freaking awesome. I can't wait for you guys to hear from her. She'll be on from eight to nine, excuse me, from seven to eight. And at 8 p.m., we'll move into the call-in portion of the show. So if you're not signed up for me on the call-in app, definitely subscribe to my call-in show. Um, I've really been enjoying that so far. And um, I think some of you guys have too. So thanks so much for the super chat, Lucky Burrito. Can't wait to have you back on the show. Much love. Thank you so much. I'll be there soon. Uh, things are winding down. Uh, and this weekend, we will be having a third party summit on Revolutionary Blackout Network. Definitely check that out. We got a lot to say, a lot of panels. I know some of the people I know are going to be there. Uh, Jill Stein will be there. Uh, Steph, who hosts with Jimmy, Steph Zamorano, she will be there. I think I'm co-hosting with her on Saturday. Uh, so there's lots of information that people need to hear about third parties. You're going to hear from third party candidates as well. So definitely check that out this weekend. Sunday night, I'll be back also with Ethnic Women's Liberation Panel. We're going to do the fun episode this time. We're going to talk about dating. <laughs> dating adventures. Definitely come back for that. But other than that, I'll see you guys tomorrow. So have a good night. Keep up the fight.